Hello and welcome to our second set of canine infectious illnesses. Today we're going to start with Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is caused by uh, a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, this is a spirochete type of bacteria. So it has that uh, like kind of squiggly spiral shape and it is transmitted from deer ticks. Uh, the vector is Ixodes scapularis, which is the deer tick, also known as the black-legged tick. Uh, it spreads through tick bites, um, so it goes from the deer tick saliva to the patient's blood. And um, usually, so that, um, that transmission usually takes about 24 to 36 hours of that uh, tick feeding to be able to transmit. So if you do tick checks regularly, like daily, every 24 hours, um, you'll be able to, in theory, catch any of those ticks before they, um, you know, really cause a problem there. Sorry, I'm just trying to adjust my camera here. So incubation time is two to five months, which means that if you find a deer tick on your dog yesterday and bring it into the clinic today, we can't do a Lyme disease test and see if your dog has Lyme disease. We're not gonna get a positive for quite some time. So typically when we look at doing just routine testing for these things, we are testing about six months past when they would have been exposed. And then, um, and then we're able to get a positive if it is positive, if the dog has uh, Lyme disease. And um, we're, we're able to catch it fairly early then in order to begin treatment. Um, in terms of clinical disease, if it's treated, uh, we can usually get it, um, uh, you know, into remission or at least not getting worse in about a month. Usually there's, it's about a month long, uh, treatment. If it's left untreated though, undiagnosed and untreated, it is a lifelong illness. The systems that are affected, the joints are the, affected the most. Uh, then the heart, the kidneys, and occasionally we'll see uh, central nervous system signs. So dogs um, will see shifting leg lameness. That's a really classic clinical sign of Lyme disease that we see in dogs, and we don't see it with any other illness. So it's pretty um, uh, indicative of Lyme disease. So shifting leg lameness means that one day the dog's limping on their front right leg and the next day the dog's limping on their hind left leg and then their right front leg again and then left front leg and then hind left leg and it just moves around that way so um, it's not one specific leg that they're constantly limping on it shifts around to different legs so that's a pretty classic clinical sign of Lyme disease Joint and muscle pain is a big one as well. We'll see um, uh, lymph node swelling, uh, anorexia and lethargy, um, fever sometimes. And if it's left to progress, we'll see liver and kidney infections. We'll see heart conditions such as myocarditis. We'll see uh, possibly seizures as well. Um, so that, like I said, is not going to be immediate. It's going to be anywhere between two and five months after that, uh, that initial exposure. Uh, to diagnose Lyme disease, we can go based on clinical signs. We can go based on history. Uh, but to really confirm it, we're going to go ahead and use the IDEX ELISA SNAP test, the 4DX test. Uh, so the IDEX, um, the ELISA, it's an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Uh, it's a SNAP test, uh, which means that we can run it right in clinic. And we'll get a result, a positive result, if the dog is positive after six months uh, after exposure. So the 4DX, the DX stands for diagnosis. It diagnoses four different potential illnesses. It diagnoses Lyme disease anaplasma and ehrlichia, which are all tick-borne illnesses. And then it also diagnoses heartworm. So when dogs come in for their annual heartworm test, not only do we get to find out if they have heartworm, we also get to find out if they've been exposed to any of these tick-borne illnesses. 
So it's kind of like a, a four in one test, which is quite handy. Uh, for treatment wise, um, actually, sorry, I wanna talk a little bit more about diagnosis because I see that it's not in here and that's fine um, in terms of um, the test or whatever, just knowing the 40X is great. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the Quant C6 test. So the Quant C6 is a test that you can run um, that goes to an outside lab and it uh, quantifies how much Lyme disease, um, uh, like bacteria, I guess, um, is, is present. So it, it, it quantifies how severe the illness is, kind of. So um, some animals will have really high numbers but not really have any clinical signs. Some will have lower numbers and have lots of clinical signs. Basically, if you're going to run a quant C6 test, you need to run it before treating for, with antibiotics and after treating with antibiotics to see if the um, like quantity has gone down, right? So if there's been improvement in the condition. You don't necessarily need to do that. If it's a question of the owner being able to afford treating with antibiotics or doing the quant C6 test, you go ahead and you do the antibiotics. Uh, but it is something that if the owner wants to kind of do like best medicine, then we're, then we're going to look at doing that quant C6 test as well. Uh, okay, so how do we treat this? Um, it's best if we can get treated right away. Um, so if we can catch it really early, like within a week of the animal starting to show clinical signs, about 90% of animals are going to respond really rapidly to a round of antibiotics for at least 30 days. The antibiotic that we use is called doxycycline. Uh, that's a really effective one against Lyme disease. Uh, these animals though could become potential chronic carriers, which means that if, um, like that they can, they can reinfect other ticks and spread it around still. Uh, but if they are not showing clinical signs anymore, that's, um, that's a good thing for them. In terms of prevention, there is a vaccine available, which is nice. It is a non-core vaccine though. So we're not gonna do it for every single dog. It's just gonna be the dogs that are at higher risk of contracting Lyme disease. That includes dogs that go out to the lake with their owners, like to go for walks in the parks or go for walks in the woods or go hiking. That's where uh, they're gonna pick up this Lyme disease, these Lyme disease ticks. Deer ticks tend to be most active in the spring and the fall. They do have a second bloom in the fall. We'll talk more about Lyme, I mean, sorry, uh, deer ticks when we discuss uh, parasites. So you'll find out all about their life cycles. Um, but they do show up kind of uh, spring and fall and um, they like to hang out in the leaf litter. So lots of people think like long grass equals ticks. And that's true for like your typical, um, uh, you know, just like your typical wood tick or whatever. But the deer ticks, they like to hang out in the leaf litter. So if your dog's running through the woods, they're more at risk for deer ticks. So we'll evaluate the dog based on kind of what their lifestyle choices are um, in terms of how much they're, like if they're camping or anything like that. If the owners are wanting to do a Lyme disease vaccine, we're gonna do one dose at or after nine weeks. Then we're gonna booster it four weeks after, and then we rebooster every year. So this, this vaccine is only good for one year. The immunity doesn't last very long with this one compared to like the, you know, rabies or distemper, all those that were like three years. Uh, best way to prevent is to do kind of a combination of the vaccine, some tick control products and regular tick checks so that you can remove those ticks right away. And then is it zoonotic? No, uh, because you're not gonna catch it from your dog. That being said, if you are bit by a deer tick, it is certainly possible that you could get Lyme disease from the deer tick, but you are not gonna get Lyme disease from your dog. One thing that I like to tell people, it can be really hard to get a Lyme disease diagnosis in a human. Um, I don't know why. I just, I don't know if they don't have the testing available or if it's really expensive. Like, I just don't know why, but I've, I've heard that it's really difficult to get, um, get any kind of testing or a diagnosis of Lyme disease. 
If you have a dog that tests positive for Lyme disease, that's kind of like um, a little alarm that you've been exposed to Lyme disease as well, potentially. So you're going out into the woods with your dog, your dog picks up a deer tick and is bit and has Lyme disease. It's absolutely potential that you are bit as well by a different tick, obviously, and also contract Lyme disease. So if you are a human having those symptoms and your dog also is diagnosed, I think that's a really um, compelling argument for your doctor to test you for Lyme disease. So I do like to let people know about that link as well, right? Because if your dog has tested positive, you should be concerned about yourself as well. So moving on, uh, West Nile fever is our next illness we're going to discuss. Um, it's caused by the agent West Nile virus. You guys probably, well, maybe remember hearing about this. It was kind of a big deal, maybe like 10 or so years ago. It was um, a pretty big thing. Like there was, um, you know, anytime anyone saw any dead birds laying around, they were very concerned about West Nile virus. Lots of horses were really badly affected and lots of humans as well. Uh, I'm honestly not super sure why we talk about this in this course. It's in the curriculum, so it's here. I'm going to kind of breeze past it, um, but I'll highlight for you right here. Clinical signs in pets, almost always none. So why are we bothering to really talk about it? Uh, but we'll breeze through it pretty quickly. Incubation time, 2 to 15 days. It's transmitted by a vector of a mosquito. So remember, a vector is like a living thing that transmits an illness. Uh, so the mosquito is the vector in this case. Uh, the reservoirs of this illness are corvidae birds. That includes crows, blue jays, ravens. Clinical disease in dogs and cats, they're considerably resistant. Again, not sure why we're talking about this. But horses, humans, and birds are more susceptible, corvidae birds specifically. Systems affected, um, uh, I guess you could say central nervous, sure. Um, in humans, usually none. It's like the, it was the young, the old, and the immunocompromised that we're most concerned about. Um, there were some elderly people contracting West Nile virus and dying from it when it was kind of in its peak there for a while. Um, but typically most people are not affected. Horses will have flu-like symptoms and meningitis. So that's the inflammation of the meninges, which is the lining of the brain and the spinal cord. Encephalitis. Uh, encephal is the brain. And itis is inflammation, so inflammation of the brain, and then paralysis. Pets, almost always none in terms of clinical signs. Birds can have flu-like symptoms, paralysis, and seizures. Is this a debilitating illness? Not in dogs and cats. <laughs> um, shedding, you're not shedding the virus because the mosquito is the vector. Um, so we're not really concerned about virus shedding with this one. Treatment, we can't treat the virus itself, right? So we could do supportive care if needed. Um, there is a horse vaccine available, but that's the only one that has it. Uh, best way to prevent is use mosquito repellent. Uh, pups are going to be the most affected um, it, for like dogs. The young, the old, the immunocompromised are the ones that we're most uh, concerned about. Um, is there reoccurrence? No. If you've caught it once, you are immune. And how do we diagnose this? We can run, uh, we'll send away a blood test that will identify West Nile virus antibodies in the blood. So again, is that definitive that the, the animal has West Nile virus at the moment? No, because we're testing for antibodies present. Antibodies present only means that the animal has been exposed to it at some point. We can't confirm for sure that they have it at the moment. For prognosis, in humans it's fairly good. It could be occasionally fatal. Like I said, there were some old people that were dying. In horses, about a third that develop clinical signs will die. And in pets, the prognosis is very good because they're pretty resistant. Is it zoonotic? No, you're not gonna catch it from your dog. 
However, humans are affected if they catch it from the mosquito. And that's it. I kind of gloss over that one because I just don't think it's that important in terms of dogs. Our next illness is leptospirosis. Uh, it's caused by the lepto, hold on, leptospir, leptospira, I think, something like that. I can't remember the name of the bacteria. Leptospirosis is the name of the illness. It's caused by uh, like the leptobacteria, which is another spirochete. Incubation on this illness is two to four weeks. Uh, it's transmitted in the urine. So if urine comes into contact with cuts or mucous membranes, it can be contracted that way. Uh, urine oral, so either urine in contact with food, urine in contact with water, urine in contact with soil, and then uh, getting into the mouth somehow. It can also be transmitted by bite wounds through the placenta and sexually as well. Clinical disease lasts about seven to eight days. Um, and then systems affected, it's the kidney and the liver are the most affected. So in humans, because this is zoonotic, it's highly zoonotic. In humans, you're going to see flu-like symptoms, ocular pain, so like painful eyes. And you can see kidney and liver failure. And if you do see that, then you'll see uh, jaundice, right? If you have the liver failure. In pets, they show flu-like symptoms, epistaxis. Do you remember what that one means? Epistaxis is a nosebleed. PUPD, polyuria, polydipsia, so um, excessive urinating, excessive thirst. Uh, they could have melina. Melina is a black stool. So when we have melina, uh, it means that there's bleeding in like the upper GI tract. So either like stomach, uh, small intestine area, and then that blood has been digested and it leaves the stool black and tarry. We'll see shivering and convulsions. We'll see uh, clotting disorders, kidney and liver failure, and therefore jaundice. Uh, we can see anemia, fever, and muscle tenderness. So lots of different clinical signs for pets. Is this one debilitating? You can be left with chronic liver and kidney issues. If the animal is not treated, uh, it could take months to recover, if at all. How long are they shedding the virus for? Anywhere between weeks and months, and it's shed in the urine. So we really wanna make sure that we let owners know about that to be careful with handling anything that their animals are urinating in or around or on, because it is um, uh, very zoonotic. The owners can catch this. Uh, treatment, can we treat um, the bacteria? Yes, yes we can. So uh, we can't treat viruses, but since this is a bacteria, we can use antibiotics to treat it. Uh, we're also going to do supportive care of IV fluids and potentially blood transfusions as well. There is a vaccine available, but it is known to cause reactions. So um, it's fairly rare that we actually use this one. I've had a few breeding animals where they, the owners want to have leptospirosis vaccine, uh, but um, your typical average pet is not going to get this as a vaccine. Uh, in terms of pups, the younger animals are more likely to be affected and are affected harder. Um, like they have more clinical signs and have a more severe illness. Uh, is it possible to have reoccurrence? Yes, because it's a bacteria, uh, there are different strains. Um, bacteria are a little bit more difficult to develop um, immunity to versus like a virus. So uh, reoccurrence is certainly possible with lepto. How do we diagnose it? Clinical signs, uh, history, I mean, that's our, that's our answer all the time, right? Uh, and then also there is a blood test that we can send to an outside lab that will confirm. <clears throat> uh, prognosis is um, acute. If it's acute and severe, then um, it's, it's a guarded prognosis, which means it, it kind of could go either way. Um, it's usually fair to good though otherwise. And then we had said before, 
that um, there could be chronic liver and kidney issues after. Um, so in the environment, since it is a spirochete, its favorite hangout is going to be in slow moving contaminated water. So anywhere we have kind of, you know, those little pond areas where animals are urinating near, you're more likely to catch them from there. And then is it zoonotic? Yes, it's highly zoonotic and it's pretty um, not fun to get. And I know that because I have a friend who caught leptospirosis from drinking raw milk. So um, she uh, lived next door to a farmer who was, um, who had cows and she was, uh, oh, I don't know, it was so funny, like on Pinterest, she was pinning all this stuff about how raw milk's so good for you. And then, um, and then the, so raw milk is like unprocessed, it hasn't been pasteurized. Uh, so she's drinking this raw milk and I guess it was contaminated with, um, clearly some urine at some point. And, um, so she got really sick and she was hospitalized for a long time. And then from treating that, she, um, got like a C. diff infection from the hospital and then had to be in quarantine. So that was, uh, really ridiculous. And like, thank goodness she's better now, but, uh, do be aware that this one is very zoonotic. Uh, our next one is another bacteria, Salmonella. I'm sure you guys have heard about this one before. Salmonella is present on raw chicken. Um, it can be present in eggs. It's present in raw flour. Uh, it's present in a lot of different foods. Um, incubation time on this is 12 to 36 hours. So salmonella is a big cause of food poisoning. And that's basically what we'll see here as well. So it's transmitted, it's a fecal oral route. It's transmitted in feces and saliva. Typically animals are going to get sick with this from either ingesting infected animals like birds or by eating garbage. So in cats, it's sometimes uh, like commonly called songbird fever because they eat birds infected or dogs. This is one of many things that we'll call garbage gut in dogs. Systems affected are the GI tract. Uh, in clinical signs in, for pets, we'll see uh, some, most of them will be subclinical, but we'll see fever and anorexia. We'll see vomiting and diarrhea, abdominal pain. And if it's a really bad um, infection, we could see septicemia. So remember that's like a, a whole blood infection. In humans, typically fever, nausea, could be potentially septicemia as well. Uh, people and animals can certainly die from salmonella. Is it debilitating? It's usually self-limiting, uh, so that's a good thing. I'm sure we've all had food poisoning at some point in our lives. Uh, it's not fun, but um, usually, you know, it's like the, kind of the 24-hour flu, right? You feel better the next day. In terms of shedding, it can be shed for prolonged periods after. I don't have a firm answer for you on how long. And then treatment, uh, I said before, is usually self-limiting, but if required, we could do supportive treatments. May or may not need antibiotics, especially if there's septicemia, you'll need antibiotics. And if there's a lot of vomiting and diarrhea, we're probably more concerned about dehydration. We're gonna wanna add in some IV fluids as well. Uh, there's no vaccine available for salmonella. Can it reoccur? Absolutely. If they keep getting in the garbage, they're going to keep getting sick. We can diagnose with either a fecal culture or a bacterial culture. Um, I have never actually sent one away. I'm just trying to think if I've ever actually, we've ever actually tested for this one. Typically, we'll just kind of treat symptomatically, maybe give them some antiemetics and then fluids and send them on their way. Uh, prognosis is generally good. Some animals, though, could end up with chronic mild diarrhea. And then in rare cases, typically you're young, you're old, you're immunocompromised. Typically, those guys, are it's more uh, likely that they could potentially die. In the environment, it'll be found in garbage. It's found in infected birds. And, oh, what's that last one say there? Hmm, oh, raw diets. 
Raw diets are the worst for salmonella. It's really possible for people and their animals to get really sick from raw diets. Uh, this is just a little taste of my raw diet rant. I'll go on in nutrition. <laughs> Uh, but raw diets are not exceptionally safe at all, and there's a lot of potential for animals to get pretty sick from them. And then um, zoonotic. So uh, it's not likely that we'll get sick from the animal, but the animal could get sick from us. So a reverse zoonosis is possible. And that's it for salmonella. Moving on to tetanus. Uh, tetanus is one of the um, vaccines that we should have up to date when we're working in the hospital, FYI. So we should have our tetanus up to date, our rabies up to date, and our flu shot up to date. You should have all three of those. So tetanus is caused by a bacteria neurotoxin. Uh, the bacteria is Clostridium tetani. Uh, incubation time for tetanus is one to three weeks and transmission is by contamination of open wounds with spores. So if you've had any injuries uh, in the past, you know, like my sister had stepped on a rusty nail, they updated her tetanus. I cut myself with a pair of scissors and I had a big gash in my hand. Um, they updated my tetanus. So typically tetanus vaccine is given once every 10 years or it's boosted if you've had some kind of uh, wound that could potentially be contaminated and dirty. Uh, the clinical disease is caused by the toxin binding to the nerves and therefore the system that's affected is the nervous system. It affects the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Clinical signs will see muscle rigidity. So uh, tetanus, perhaps um, you've heard of like lockjaw, that's, that's a tetanus thing. Um, animals and people will have a stilted gait. So gait refers to how the animal walks and a stilted gait, they're not really bending their knees at all. So it's really like, uh, like picture a person walking on a pair of stilts. Um, that's, that's a stilted gait. Um, a tetanic paralysis, um, that is uh, just paralysis caused by tetanus. Uh, they could have convulsions, a grinning appearance and lockjaw. And then fever, hyperesthesia, and throat spasms. So hyperesthesia, what does that one mean? Pick apart that one with your word, word parts. So esthes is sensation. The ia is just pertaining to or relating to. And uh, hyper is increased um, or excessive. So this is like an increased sensation. Hyper, hyperesthesia is where they're really sensitive to any kind of sensory input. Is it debilitating? Yes, it's a really long and intensive treatment. Honestly, in animals, we're probably just gonna euthanize. Shedding, it is shed in the feces and then, um, then the bacteria leaves little spores and the spores can cause tetanus. Uh, treatment, we are going to just do a supportive treatment. Um, we want to maintain the airway, so we might have to intubate the animal. We need to keep them in a dark and quiet area because of that hyperesthesia. We're going to give them some IV fluids. We'll be tube feeding them because they're not going to be able to eat. And we want to give them some soft bedding because, again, any kind of, it's like the princess and the pea, right? Any kind of discomfort is going to really be excessively felt by them because of that hyperesthesia. Uh, there is a vaccine available, but only for horses and people, not uh, dogs. So we will not be vaccinating dogs for tetanus. It is possible for it to reoccur. How terrible to get that twice. Um, and then uh, clinical, oh, sorry, diagnosis. We're going to obviously clinical signs are going to be pretty telling uh, and history as well. But we could do a bacteria culture um, to check for uh, the presence of that clostridium. Prognosis, uh, the severely affected may die even with treatment. Um, untreated, the animal will die. Uh, in the environment, it'll be typically in the soil, but anywhere feces can be, uh, tetanus can be. And then is it zoonotic? Um, well, I mean, yes and no, I guess. It's unlikely you're gonna get it from your dog, though, if your dog did have it. 
um, it's more likely that you're gonna get it from like, yeah, injuring yourself and then having a contaminated wound. Our next one is canine coronavirus enteritis. So this coronavirus is not related to COVID-19. I wanna get that out of the way right off the bat. Um, there are many different kinds of coronaviruses, just the way there are many different kinds of uh, like clostridium viruses. There's lots of different kinds of um, salmonella viruses even. There's lots of different kinds of herpes viruses. It's unrelated to COVID-19. So the canine coronavirus causes an enteritis. So what is that? Itis is inflammation of, enter is the small intestine. So we're gonna see a GI tract affected by the canine coronavirus. So transmission is fecal oral. Uh, the virus is, <coughs> sorry, shed in the feces and then animals can uh, pick it up via their mouths. Um, we're gonna see, oh, the GI tract is affected, of course. Clinical signs, uh, lethargy and anorexia. We're gonna see vomiting and diarrhea. Because of the vomiting and diarrhea, we'll see dehydration. Uh, this is more likely to be worse though in puppies than adults. Typically in adults, they're gonna have either no signs or significantly less severe signs. Shedding occurs for about two weeks at least, but many animals become chronic carriers. Uh, and then sometimes kind of end up reinfecting themselves as well. Uh, treatment wise, we it's a virus, so we can't treat the virus specifically. Um, but we do want to offer supportive treatment if needed. So uh, IV fluids, if they're dehydrated, maybe um, you know antiemetics if they're vomiting a lot. We want to isolate the pets so that they're not spreading it around to others. Uh, as we know, coronaviruses are very contagious. And then um, if they have any other kind of like secondary infections, we may or may not be offering antibiotics. There is a vaccine available, but it is non-core. Uh, typically, like I'm trying to, I've never given this vaccine. I'm trying to think of situations where you might. And then in pups, usually less than 12 weeks of age are gonna be the worst affected. And it is a guarded prognosis if those animals are very ill. Uh, in terms of reoccurrence, many animals do become chronic carriers, uh, especially if you have multiple animals in the house, they can pass it back and forth. Diagnosis, clinical signs and history, there is lab work that can uh, confirm coronavirus as well. That's something we would send to an outside lab. And then prognosis in adult animals, adult healthy animals, it's a good prognosis because it's usually self-limiting, but it is guarded in pups. And then is it zoonotic? No, this is not a zoonotic coronavirus. And I'm pretty sure this is our last one. Yes, rabies is our last topic. And this is actually fairly a big topic, I think. So the illness is rabies and it's caused by the rabies virus. The rabies virus host can be any warm-blooded animals. Um, so that is, actually that's not necessarily true. It's all mammals because uh, birds are warm-blooded as well, but they are not affected. Um, typically it's gonna be carnivorous mammals that are the most affected. And yes, it is all mammals can be affected by rabies. Someone asked me the question once, um, well, what about dolphins? Dolphins are mammals, can dolphins get it? What about whales? Yes. Dolphins and whales would get rabies if they were bit by a rabid animal, but the likelihood of a whale or a dolphin encountering like a rabid skunk is pretty slim to none. So typically you're not actually gonna see it, but it is possible for any mammal to contract rabies. Uh, so the animals that are predisposed are any unvaccinated animal, especially those with exposure to wildlife. So if you have like farm dogs and you're not vaccinating for rabies, you're bonkers. You should really be doing that. Incubation time is extreme. Anywhere between two weeks and a year between being bit and showing clinical signs. Um, the reason for the discrepancy there is it kind of depends where you've been bit. 
the animal's not going to start showing clinical signs until that virus reaches the brain. If you're bit on the face, it's going to get to your brain really quickly. If you're bit on like your, you know, big toe, it's going to take a lot longer for that virus to travel all the way through your body to get up to your brain. So it can take um, a significantly long time to develop uh, clinical signs. Transmission, it is usually transmitted via bites because it is a saliva to blood transmission. Um, the uh, virus is viable in the carcass for about 24 hours. But as far as I understand, like unless the animal, actually, I don't even think that makes sense. I think even if the animal ate the salivary glands, I don't think they'd get sick necessarily because it has to be transmitted saliva to blood. And if you're eating it, that's not the same thing. Um, but bo mostly the issue is bites that, that, sh that spreads this one around. So clinical disease is, um, very significant. The animal will die within 10 days of developing clinical signs. And that's any mammal that contracts rabies. Once clinical signs are seen, that is a death sentence. Um, there has been historically a total of, um, Oh geez, now I'm not sure. It's two, possibly three people that have survived after having rabies and developing clinical signs. Um, because what they did is they put those people into like basically a, a medically induced coma and, um, and, and treated them with, I guess, pretty aggressive antivirals and somehow managed to um, get, them, get them through it. That being said, though, there have been many other people that have been exposed to rabies that did not um, recover based on this treatment. So one, the first, the first person that survived was a little boy. He was bit by um, by a rabid bat. I think he was in Ontario or Quebec. I can't remember where. Uh, I think another person was a BC woman. So both in Canada. And then I'm, it might honestly be no other no other ones. There might have been one fairly recently. I'm not sure on that. I might be just imagining it though. Uh, so basically, if you develop clinical signs of rabies, you will die. Uh, and that's why this is a big one in terms of vaccination. Um, okay, so systems affected. The CNS and the brain are the big ones mostly affected. Salivary glands as well, because that's where the virus resides in terms of spreading. Clinical signs, we're going to see di two different stages. Uh, rabies is kind of... Um, it, it's sometimes said like the first stages are called um, uh, like rage rabies and then the end stage is dumb rabies. So at first we're going to see um, changes in personality in the animal. So for example, if it's wildlife, animals that are usually nocturnal that are out during the day, that's like a big like, you know, warning sign for rabies. Um, animals that are usually really hidden and don't come out in terms of wildlife that, um, that are showing up, uh, during the day, um, and like trying to interact with people, that's a big warning sign. So typically, um, we're going to see those changes. Uh, they're going to show, uh, apprehension, nervousness, and anxiety. They could have a fever, could be constantly licking the bite site because, um, the uh, virus is like traveling through the nerves, so it kind of makes, makes the bite site feel strange. Um, and they could at that point have that, um, like that rage, right? Where they're, they're like trying to bite and stuff like that. Uh, end stage, so where we're seeing where the animal is close to death, we're gonna see that kind of uh, dumb rabies, right? So we'll see like, extreme lethargy We'll see paralysis where they can't really walk very well um, or like they're kind of stumbling, like their walking is really strange and they're stumbling around. They'll have hydrophobia, which is um, a fear of water. So they're really scared about swallowing. They'll have hypersalivation, so they're drooling a lot. That's why you see like, you know, people that foaming at the mouth thing you see um, as like, Anytime you see any reference to rabies, that's that hypersalivation. So they're, they're salivating excessively and they can't swallow their saliva. So the hydropho hydrophobia and hypersalivation are causing that foaming at the mouth. We'll see the animal having noise sensitivity. 
They could have pika, which means they're eating things that aren't food, so usually things like dirt. And uh, finally, they'll have a coma. They'll go into coma and then they'll die. Um, shedding, you're only going to see virus shedding once, um, once the virus is into the salivary glands. And that happens once, um, once clinical signs occur. Uh, so treatment is a whole thing. Um, for animals, Pete, can you get the cat? Um, for um, animals, if they're exposed, we want to just try to vaccinate them as soon as possible. Before, um, before they show clinical signs, in theory, we might be able to kind of turn this around so that they don't get clinical signs. Uh, at the time of the bite, we want to, for humans, wash that bite really, really well. And then there's five post-exposure vaccines that need to be done. Fortunately for us, we'll have had our pre-exposure. Uh, so you get three uh, vaccines. And then if you're ever bit and there's potential for rabies, you just get two post-exposures after. Um, once clinical signs develop, however, there is no treatment. Unfortunately, the animal will die within 10 days. So if an animal bites a person, we need to quarantine that animal for 10 days if they've been vaccinated for rabies. So if they've been vaccinated, um, the theory is that within 10 days, clinical signs would show up and then uh, if they did have rabies and then we would know. Um, but if typically if they've been vaccinated, they're going to be protected. Um, if the animal is unvaccinated, they need to be quarantined for six months, waiting for signs of rabies. Um, if the animal had been vaccinated at least 28 days prior to the bite, the animal or the person, uh, sorry, the animal should be protected and you should be protected if that animal bites you. Um, why can't we just test? Why can't we just test if they have rabies? Why do we have to do these ridiculous six months of quarantine? Well, the diagnosis for rabies, we need to submit the brain for testing. Um, the only way to submit a brain for testing is to uh, remove the brain from a deceased animal. So uh, typically that's not something we can do to just test someone's pet and see if they have rabies. So that's something that we would do after an animal has either been euthanized or has died to confirm if rabies was present. There are um, rabies test collectors in Manitoba that um, will be called out to the clinic to take care of those testing. Uh, I believe you contact the provincial veterinarian to arrange that. So prognosis, very poor. Once, uh, once clinical signs develop, it's absolutely fatal. And then is there a vaccine? Yes, yay, it is a core vaccine. Every animal should be vaccinated. Well, sorry, every dog should be vaccinated for rabies. Every cat too, actually. We don't talk about rabies, I don't think, in the cat section, but this applies to cats as well. So uh, the vaccine protocol for rabies is different than the DA2PP, um, all those core ones we talked about yesterday. Rabies is a core vaccine, but it is not 8, 12, and 16 weeks. It's just given it 16 weeks for puppies. Then it's boosted at one year, and then typically either every one to three years. You need to see what type of vaccine you've, you've given. They're um, available in one year and three-year doses. And then is it zoonotic? Yes, absolutely it is, and it's dangerously zoonotic. So why do we vaccinate for rabies? I think it's pretty clear. I think rabies is the illness to illustrate all of those criteria for why we vaccinate. We vaccinate for rabies to protect public health because it's extremely zoonotic. Um, you're less likely to be bitten by wildlife than you are your own pet. If your pet has been exposed to rabies from wildlife because your pet's more likely to incur encounter that wildlife, you could be bit by your pet and be exposed. Um, especially like if you're living on a farm and you have farm animals that are outside all the time, you're not necessarily gonna know if they've been exposed to wildlife that are acting strangely. So this does help to protect that public health. 
Uh, it's also really extreme illness in terms of it is fatal once those clinical signs develop. And, um, and it's just really inconvenient that if your animal does bite somebody, uh, it needs to be quarantined for six months if it hasn't been vaccinated, or it needs to be euthanized for, uh, for testing. So this illness, I think, really illustrates very well why we choose to do vaccination. I think it kind of hits all those marks. Now, you might be asking yourself, what, uh, what wildlife causes the most problems in Manitoba? So people often think it's going to be um, like raccoons. Raccoons definitely can carry it. It's definitely um, a reservoir. Typically, though, raccoons are not the problem in Manitoba. People also tend to think bats, rabid bats. Pretty sure it was bats that bit Cujo in that movie and gave him rabies, right? Um, people tend to think bats. And bats are a factor for sure in like BC and Ontario and Quebec, but Manitoba less so. In Manitoba, our number one animal carrying rabies is the skunk. So animals, um, or sorry, uh, uh, rabies is spread most by skunks. So you might be asking yourself also, really, really, Laura, how common is rabies in Manitoba? So last year there were 18 confirmed cases. Uh, most of them were bovines, which are cattle, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're raising beef cattle, you're going to just send your animals out to the field for a good six months and not really do too much with them or interact with them all that much while they're fattening up for slaughter, right? So it's really likely that they could encounter wildlife with rabies out, you know, in the back 40 kind of thing. Um, there were a couple dogs that were tested and one did have rabies in Manitoba. Um, and I think there may have been some horses and like sheep tested. I can't, I can't remember the whole report. I should post the report for you. That would be a uh, probably interesting reading. So, um, anyways, that's it. That's everything I have to say about, uh, canine infectious illnesses. So if you do have any questions, make sure you do reach out and ask them in the chat in the virtual classroom or send me an email. All right. Thank you for listening.